<laughs> we need we need some masala. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, I, I, I know you built these all over the world. Is there one climate that's easier to build in our shipping that makes it cheaper, easier, that makes it perform better? Well, uh, obviously, I think sunny climates are, are easier because you can get more power, more energy. Sunny, cold climates, you know. <laughs> but we've done them so many different places that it's just our, our effort is to make them a, a universal design that can take care of people anywhere. And we used to have, as you can see, all these different... Uh, designs which are really going to go away in our new education facility because we're going to be presenting the current uh, situation more. But we've gone through so many different designs and they, they were all evolving due to all the different climates we were encountering. And we started seeing that, well, if we can, if we can standardize a design that just gets tweaked for every climate, it becomes more available to people. Because uh, that's the big thing is that uh, whatever you do it's got to be easy for people to to get it to acquire it to build it to buy it whatever uh, it can't if you get too much custom and tailoring it just makes it too expensive it keeps you from standardizing you know the the industry the automobile industry all the different industries have done a good job of that in terms of standardizing their product no matter how bad the product is. Uh, they've standardized it so people can get it. And so we learn from that because uh, part of getting something out there is making it so that people can, can obtain it somehow. Somebody had a question over here? Yeah, I was wondering about glass technology. Um, have you looked much into sort of ergon filled glass and all these tints for different uh, well, another thing that we're trying to do, and since we go around the world a lot, we, we get caught up in this. Uh, one thing that steers us away from that is it, we want to make these buildings made out of products that are available in even a third world country. And it turns out that tires and cans and cement and rebar, some wood is available. Uh, glass is, so that's kept us from the high tech glasses. But uh, if you've got glass on a north side for whatever reason, or east or west even, then some of those kind of glasses, if you can afford them, make some sense. You don't really need to use them on the front face because they retard solar gain, some of them. And of course the organ filled, then you, they, they, they're just radically more expensive. So we're trying to use materials that are, you know, I'd rather do a third greenhouse and justify it with more water catchment, more food production, more sewage treatment. And see, that's another thing. If you're in a climate, a serious cold climate, that your black water system like we have here that green up the mesa uh, is not going to grow in the, for six months because it's severe cold. That's another justification for another greenhouse, not only is it a buffer zone, a water catchment, and a sewage treatment, it lets the plants grow year round. Maybe it'll get down to 40, but plants will live if it's not freezing. So um, we, rather than go into higher tech pieces of glass, we go into just more greenhouses because it's really easy to justify them. People can add them. Like if, if you're in northern Canada and you build the global earthship, then we set it up so that you can add this and we're doing that on quite a few right now. In phase two, they're going to they're gonna be surviving reasonably well with this, but they're going to be super comfortable with this and have more plants, more sewage treatment, and so on. Yeah? When you add the third greenhouse, why do you pitch the roof up? Why don't you just maintain a straight line and the simplest roof design? Because uh, we pitch, the, I always draw it that way because the, I relate it to the winter sun angle. So this angle would be less in, closer to the equator and steeper, no, this angle would be less the further north you go and, and closer to the equator you go, it'd be higher, except then when it gets warm, you don't even need it anyway. So in a northern climate, I match this line with the winter angle of the sun so that this structure 
This is glass. This is insulated structure. So that the sun makes it all the way into the house still. So I don't want to block any sun by this buffer zone. I just want to trap uh, more temperature so that this minus 40 degrees is not felt all the way in here where the people are. So I'm still trying to get the sun in. It wouldn't be cheaper to just go straight from that highest point to the lowest point in the back and not have that... Like this. Well, if you're going to do it from the get-go, yeah, that could be structured. But a lot of times, uh, that's one way you could do it. Uh, but since this, in our, our efforts to standardize, since this, this is worthy of standardization, this global model, then this is an add-on to the global model. So rather than change the whole structure of the global model, we can keep it standardized and add this and when you do add this, you find that you have to adjust it. So you'd be dealing with a separate set of drawings for every latitude, uh, and we're trying to avoid stuff like that. Yeah? I actually have three questions. Um, one, can you talk a little bit about what affects room depth? Um, if you have a U, I think Christian was saying you have the ability to go a little bit further from the greenhouse. Yeah, if you, well, room depth was, was in the early days, a, di a discussion because if you, have a, uh, if you have a mild winter, then you can make the use pretty deep because you're not getting that cold. And it, in fact, it's cooler back here in the summertime. And if you're having a severe winter, you make the rooms more shallow because uh, then the sun and the airspace you're trying to heat is less relative to the similar glass space. In other words, this is considered your source of heat. So you've got the same source of heat for a much larger space than this much smaller space. So this is what you would do in a severe winter. This is what you'd do in a mild winter. So that was the, that was the way we played with the use. But then when we started going to just making the whole building surrounded by the seven foot thick thermal mass, thermal wrapped wall, we came up with two depths. We have one of 20. That's just to the vertical face. Then the greenhouse is added to that. So we have two depths we use now that are kind of universal to the world, really. Uh, 20 and 17. 17 is more sensitive to performing better. 20 performs not quite as good in severe winter, but it's okay. And so the, the buffer zone helps make up for that then that gets into structure. If you go much, see our beams now span this way, not like they used to on the U's. So when your beams span this way, if you get more than 20, you start getting into super trusses and heavy, heavy loads. And 17 is the best because it's an easy span with either trusses or logs, which is what we use. You'll see both in the community. And so we're getting down to uh, a lot of the like when we first came up with the package design, it was this way. It was a lot cheaper. It was a lot easier. It was aimed, though, at be being easier to put together. And we thought that we're going to sacrifice some performance by making this thing easier to put together. turned out that those package buildings really performed well. Then when we added, so you, so you see the orange is the package building. We did a lot of them all over the world. And then we started going, uh, well, we can even make them better by doubling the greenhouse. And then, uh, then we doubled the greenhouse and got into this melting of water thing and shoved that into a double greenhouse uh, with a sloped roof and it turned out to be, we call it the global because it works all over the globe. And so uh, this tuning of the use is kind of old school at this point. Uh, it, it's back into custom situation. There's nothing wrong with the U's except that it, there are more details to build them, therefore more time consuming, therefore more expensive than these. The whole building is wrapped in the, the twice as thick wall. And so it's, it, what I'm getting at here is that structure, thermal dynamics, and price all go into equally uh, determining the design of this building. So a couple of other questions. Um, when you modified the design, the global design, and doubled it <coughs> down the front greenhouse um, at, the, at the roof level, are you trading off these skylights then? Are these 
<laughs> well, they're gone. I mean, they're nice. They're, they're cool because you can lay there in bed and look up at the stars. And you can, there's nothing to the light. But see, the buildings are more shallow than this. So you go in the corner cottage or then it, there's a couple of uh, globals that are built. You're going to find that they're just as light as this room. You don't really need that light. Uh, they're just as light because they're, they're shallower. And they're actually cooler because now the air comes through the earth. Rather, see, if it's 105 degrees outside, the air coming through that window and out this skylight is not really anything but fresh air. Whereas if it's 105 degrees outside and we open up a convection-driven air current that sucks this air through uh, 8 feet deep, 30 feet long of buried dirt, you have an air conditioner. It feels, up in Montana, it felt like the air conditioner in your car hitting you in the face. And so we have better movement of air, cooler air, and less, oh, no openings in the roof. Like you go up on the roof of some of these buildings, you're seeing, some of these newer buildings, you're seeing no detail. Detail is money. Detail is time. We're after the thing, so, so what I'm saying is time and money do affect design because you're tr you're, that's going to make it available to more people if it's not full of detail. Like my original, and I, I still look at, that, at things this way, uh, first of all, I want it to work. Like we're working on this heat bulb thing now. I don't care what it costs, what it looks like, how much space it takes up, I want it to work. I want to be able to put one in a corner of a room in Norway and have it emanate heat. And I'll stop at nothing to get that. But then after I get it working, then I'm going to try to make it affordable to people to buy and, and easy for people to acquire and, and on and on. So the first designs that we had with the overall building were, we don't care what the building looks like. A lot of the ones Kirsten showed you looked like they landed last night. Uh, they weren't marketable. Uh, but they illustrated to us that you can do this. So I, I keep that thinking as I go through to get more into your question too. Whatever it takes to make it work without fuel, I will do it. Then I will try to take it into uh, the economics and the simplicity of making it more available to people. But uh, uh, there's no sense in making it economical and, and available to people and easy to put together if it doesn't work. I've got to go through the making it work process first. And, and that process is at all cost. It, in other words, there's nothing that should stop you from trying to make a building that doesn't use fuel. Whatever it takes to do that, you have to do it. And that's, that's kind of how these things all evolved. The buildings early on worked just like this one. But now they're more available to people, less maintenance, more user-friendly, on and on and on. Yeah? Uh, has anybody, probably a silly question, but has anybody tried to get any of these structures insured? Yeah, yeah. they actually have. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're, both the banking, lending, and insuring are slowly getting easier and easier because actually there's a trend. It got slammed because of the recent economic crunch, but... Uh, there is a trend toward banks and insurance companies actually starting to favor carbon zero green buildings. They see if this building is not going to be a white elephant needing a ton of fuel in the future, then it's a better risk to loan on and to uh, insure. So there is a trend for that. It used to be that banks wouldn't touch them. You know, it, they were too weird. But now that's another thing. We're, even though I don't necessarily agree with the economical world and the bank world and the insurance world, I hate insurance, but, uh, but the, uh, the thing is we have to go there to relate to the masses of people that need these. And so it's kind of a, you know, we're, we, will, we will not stand on ceremony about certain things just to, in other words, to make this palatable to the to the large amounts of people. We can't be, uh, what do you call it, fanatics, although I guess I am a fanatic. But.